This is a film about war, a world war, a war which in all my years as a correspondent has somehow escaped my attention. It is a war fought in more than a hundred countries, regardless of ideology, in communist and capitalist countries, in Muslim, Buddhist and Christian countries. It's a war that has directly involved President Eisenhower, President Johnson, President Nixon, President Carter, Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong, the Dalai Lama, Mr. Khrushchev, and Father Christmas. Of course, claims by both sides in wartime are extravagant, but there is some truth in their dispatches. For example, according to one side, the entire American army has adopted its name as the very symbol of freedom and the American way. One side claims to have captured China. The other side says it has taken Russia. Indeed, no conquerors, religions, or empires have spread themselves so completely across the planet as these two superpowers, with their rallying slogans of life, liberty, and the pursuit of thirst, and we are the essence of capitalism, and we must save the world. I refer to the bittersweet war between those giants of carbonation and regurgitation, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. This saga of power and conquest began in the American Civil War in the 1860s when the Yankees beat the Confederates. The rural South was devastated. The southern capital of Atlanta, Georgia was burned to the ground. One observer wrote, dislocation and bitterness are rampant, along with melancholia, hysteria, guilt, sick headache, biliousness, drunkenness, heart palpitations, and impotence. But help was on the way. Out of the gloom came the quack doctor, a combination of traveling con man and faith healer who peddled potions of mysterious ingredients. One such medicine was called the ideal brain tonic and was invented by John Pemberton. The year was 1886. The temperance movement had become powerful and Atlanta went dry. What happened next, wrote the historian John Gaff, changed the course of civilization. The ideal brain tonic became the intellectual beverage and temperance drink, better known as Coca-Cola. Everything was a great struggle. Everything we had to do in the South to get ahead after the war was to work three times as fast as anybody of our, uh, any anybody up in Yankee Land. We just had to work like a, like the devil to get um, get things done. We did had nothing. Everything was destroyed down here. But here was Pemberton, who had all these pharmaceuticals, and he had an inventive mind, and so he liked to put together these syrups. And this particular one syrup was singled out by Pemberton as, po as a possible soft drink. Alas, Doc Pemberton was no businessman and sold the formula and title of Coca-Cola for a mere $2,300. The buyer was Asa Candler, a prosperous Atlanta chemist who launched the image and myth of Coca-Cola in the 1890s and became one of the earliest pioneers of modern-day consumer marketing. Candler, deeply religious, sold Coca-Cola as the very symbol of American wholesomeness. And with the South gripped by Old Testament revivalism and prohibition, it was all perfectly self-serving. God was happy, Coca-Cola was happy, and the consumers were happy. How could they be otherwise? Coca-Cola was then said to be part cocaine and was just the right color to disguise an illegal and uniquely refreshing slug of whiskey. This was old Atlanta in the state of Georgia, the setting for the movie Gone with the Wind, and the world headquarters to this day of Coca-Cola. Inside Coca-Cola's granite monument, the atmosphere is hushed, almost cathedral-like, with precious art and antiques in the executive suites, and ice-cold bottles of the real thing, borne on silver platters. The Coca-Cola company naturally doesn't like the word empire. But this is the center of a uniquely American empire, covering 147 countries. Coca-Cola has been going for almost a century, and during that time, revolutions have happened, wars have been fought, and regimes overthrown. 
But except for hiccups here and there, Coca-Cola has survived and grown richer and richer. Perhaps what is most extraordinary about Coca-Cola is its power of illusion, its ability to persuade generations through advertising that its product is much more than merely a bottle of sticky, sweet, colored water. When a Coca-Cola man was asked which came first, America or Coca-Cola, he said these immortal words. Let me put it this way. When you don't see a Coca-Cola sign, you have passed the borders of civilization. The borders of Coca-Cola civilization were first extended outside the United States by Asa Candler's brother, a Methodist bishop of the Hellfire variety. Cuba had just been claimed as a spoil of the Spanish-American War, and a pattern was set. When American troops marched in, Coca-Cola would follow. Cuba is our ripest mission field, rejoiced the bishop. I see a wretched population stretching out its hand to us appealingly. What we need is for these people to think and feel like Americans. The first Cuban bottling plant was opened in 1906, and Bishop Candler set about finding Methodist converts who would consume Coca-Cola and its secret formula. If we had patented the formula, mm. under American law, it would have gone into the public domain after 50 or 60 years. And all the competitors would... would well, if they uh, wanted would it, taken. they could have taken it all, but mm. the, um, the... So we didn't patent it. It's not protected. It never has been protected by law. It's just been protected by secrecy and keeping it hidden. All the same, Coca-Cola has waged a continuous legal war against those who dare to imitate the real thing. In the year 1916 alone, the court struck down Fig Cola, Candy Cola, Kaola, Coconola, Solar Cola and King Cola. One of them survived, however, and today from this sculpture-strewn American Versailles near the town of Purchase, New York, the Pepsi Cola Company rules its empire in 145 countries. Like Coca-Cola, it is Pepsi's franchise system that has made it such a huge multinational. Both provide essential ingredients to a network of bottling companies which promote and sell the soft drink according to local conditions and local politics. Each bottler, said an executive, is like a client government which will survive and prosper as long as it looks after our interests. Pepsi was invented in 1893 by Caleb B. Bradham, a Carolina chemist who claimed it could relieve upset stomach and peptic ulcers, thus Pepsi-Cola. By 1909, Pepsi had expanded to 24 states of America, but World War I changed that. As the world economy staggered, the price of sugar rose sharply, and Pepsi mistakenly invested. When sugar prices collapsed, so too did the ambitions of Caleb B. Bradham, who returned to his humble drugstore. Pepsi was not only bankrupt, but its bottles were exploding everywhere as the result of fermenting cheap molasses. Meanwhile, God-fearing Coca-Cola launched a new bottle, wickedly shaped like a woman, as well as a new owner, Robert Woodruff, whose consortium of northern banks had bought out Asa Candler in 1919 for $25 million, the biggest business deal the South had ever known. Woodruff established a foreign department and set out to sell coke to the world with an image so different from Candler's symbol of Christian mission that during the 1920s, the Women's Temperance Union launched attacks on what it called the Coca-Cola curse, claiming coke had fallen into the decadence of modern life and was as sinful as the demon rum, whose consumption prohibition had managed to increase, of course, along with the sales of Coca-Cola. By the end of the 20s, with Pepsi down and almost out, Coca-Cola produced its most remarkable advertising campaign. It invented Santa Claus. That is, it converted the legend of St. Nicholas to the modern image of Father Christmas, a jolly white-bearded character dressed in the colors of the Coca-Cola company. From now on, Santa was the real thing. 
In 1929, Wall Street crashed, but not Coca-Cola, whose profits would have doubled by 1940. By contrast, Pepsi was struggling to survive. Ironically, the Depression was to change that. During the Depression, Coca-Cola was known as the living room drink, whereas Pepsi's place was in the kitchen. Pepsi fostered its image as the drink of the working man who longed to work, of the little guy down on his luck. Its slogan was, twice as much for a nickel too, which meant that you got twice as much as Coca-Cola for the same price. I ain't got no home, I'm just a roaming round. Just a wandering worker, I go from town to town. And the police make it hard wherever I may go. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The war was now on. During the 30s, Coke sent its undercover agents, called soda spooks, on a series of raids to discover if Pepsi was being served to customers who had ordered the real thing. My brothers and my sisters are stranded on this road, a hot and dusty road that a million feet have trod. Rich man took my home and drove me from my door, and I ain't got no home in this world anymore. In 1939, Coke sued Pepsi in Canada over the use of the word cola and lost. Coke appealed to the Privy Council. That was one hell of a dirty trick, said Pepsi's president, who hired as their lawyer the presidential candidate, Wendell Wilkie, and had him flown to England in an Air Force bomber. And Pepsi won, but only because, it was whispered, Britain did not want to strain its wartime ties with the empire. This was the world's first singing commercial. Introduced by Pepsi in 1939, it became one of the best-known tunes in America. When World War II began for America at Pearl Harbor, Coca-Cola was ready, and a love letter from one GI to his wife became famous. Well, honey, wrote the soldier, I guess you want to know now what it is I want so much outside of you. Well, darling, it's a bottle of Coca-Cola. The response was immediate. When an American soldier wants a Coke, said a company vice president, it reminds him of what he's fighting for. So Coca-Cola went to war and never looked back. was the uh, complete stimulus by the displacement of the product throughout the world. We had uh, been working on it very assiduously up to the war in the 30s. As a matter of fact, the Coca-Cola Export Corporation was organized in 1930. And we'd gone into England, we had gone into Germany, into France, into Spain, and Italy a little bit, but not much. But the war was the perfect vehicle. Mr. Woodruff wanted to see that every GI had a bottle of Coke wherever he was in the world, whether he could pay for it or not. patriotism, Coca-Cola was sold over there in Hitler's Germany. Shortly after the war began, the German Office of Enemy Propaganda appointed Coca-Cola's man in Berlin, Max Keith, head of soft drink production for all of occupied Europe. They gave him a fleet of trucks and petrol, 
and the Coca-Cola company was in business behind enemy lines, and the profits grew. When it became difficult to get Coca-Cola syrup, Keith concocted a drink called Fanta, short for fantastic. In 1945, Max Keith was duly liberated by the US Marines, and Fanta went on to become a worldwide Coca-Cola product. The Coca-Cola Company presents the pause that refreshes on the air. It was a symbol of home, love, family, love, the fireside, and all that, the baseball game. And the boys really got homesick. And they thought of the corner drugstore and the walking home with the bottles and so forth and the going out on Saturday night to the public place where they could watch the girls go by or to, have, or to date the girls. And, in, and if they were broke, they always had plenty of nickels for a Coke. You know, a Coke date was quite the thing back in those days. But that's what they thought about while they were out there, bored to death. You know, this idea of hurry up and wait in the Army. And they were waiting, waiting for action, and they were bored, and they thought of home and Coke, and that was why they they really got sentimental about it. I mean, uh, I've heard stories about some of the guys getting a little bit teary about it. They didn't get all emotionally upset about a loaf of bread or a, a pound of butter. They associate, it was a matter of association of the shape of the bottle or the shape of the glass at the drugstore. Why, I can get right sentimental about it myself because I met my wife at a drugstore over a Coca-Cola. And that was even before I went with Coca-Cola. The GIs could dry their tears, for Coca-Cola was on the way. In a master stroke of public relations, the company offered to send bottling plants to the front line. And this was not only accepted, but was paid for by the War Department. Coca-Cola couldn't believe its luck. Coke was made a wartime priority item, and the Army Chief of Staff cabled theater commanders that they could order entire Coca-Cola bottling plants to be shipped direct to the front. Dispensers were installed in tanks, submarines, even fighter planes. To run it all, Coca-Cola dispatched men who were known as the Coca-Cola Colonels. The non-essential had become the indispensable. The effect of this was to associate the small green bottle with the mystique of American prosperity. Coca-Cola became a symbol of expectation, and this meant a ready-made, worldwide, multi-million dollar market. Any other company might have been accused of war profiteering, but the Coca-Cola company came home a hero. The battlefield was now the political Cold War. In communist Poland, Coca-Cola was attacked as a nest of American espionage. However, paradox intruded when the Polish temperance movement declared the most imperialistic Coca-Cola is preferable to the ideologically pure vodka. Coca-Cola, nothing like a Coke. I am not and never have been a communist. I am not and never have been a fellow traveler. I Meanwhile, Pepsi-Cola had joined up with that seeker of reds under America's beds, Senator Joe McCarthy whose politics interested the company less than his seat on the Senate Sugar Committee. McCarthy called sugar rationing anti-American and became known as the Pepsi-Cola Kid. And for this, he collected a $20,000 check from a Pepsi lobbyist. When questioned about the payoff, McCarthy said, Listen, I don't answer charges, I make them. By the 1950s, Pepsi had a new chairman, Al Steele. Steele was married to the movie star Joan Crawford, who embraced her extra wifely duties with much enthusiasm. Steele understood post-war consumer America, as John Scully, a former president of Pepsi-Cola America, explains. Now, what was going on in, in, in America at that time? Remember, we had the, what we call the baby bubble. These are the, uh, the young people who were born shortly after the Second World War when the GIs returned. 
they were moving into their teens in the, to the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, teenagers are a very high per capita consumption group for, for soft drinks. Uh, we also had a, a growing affluent middle class America. And Coke uh, had been around for a long, long time. It was a symbol of what America was. We decided we wanted Pepsi to be a symbol of what America was becoming. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we developed this idea of the Pepsi generation. We said that, that if there is a large group of uh, affluent middle class people developing, and if there are a, a large number of younger people who are going to be emerging as a, a driving force in the soft drink industry, yeah. how do we position ourselves as the product that uh, articulates for them the aspirations of this growing middle class? Because most of our uh, Americans at that time uh, were gaining affluence, but they didn't have much experience in how to spend this money. Mm. And if you look at our commercials back in the early 1960s with the Pepsi generation, you'll see uh, dirt bikes and dune buggies and all kinds of, of different uh, uh, activities, uh, many of which are commonplace in this country today. But only 20 years ago, they were still relatively new. And we associated Pepsi with those good moments. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really brought Pepsi out of the kitchen, you know, not only into the living room, but right into the smack in the middle of American culture. <laughs> Pepsi set out to undermine the subtle snob appeal of Coke by showing how youthful it was, how alive it was. So alive was Pepsi that a company man swore blind that people on the verge of suicide had called in to say that when they had seen the commercial, you've got a lot to live and Pepsi's got a lot to give, they had decided to think again. So not only does image triumph over content, it also saves lives. And that's not all. In Chinese, Come Alive with Pepsi is freely translated, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. Now, during that 20-year period of time, uh, a lot's gone on in this country. Uh, you know, we went through the Vietnam War, you know, we've had, you know, assassinations of a, of a president and other political leaders. Uh, we've had uh, Watergate. Uh, we've seen hairstyles get longer and shorter and music change. And yet, uh, the one consistency was, you know, the Pepsi generation was always the same. In Los Angeles, there is a clinic treating people who drink a dozen and more cans of Coke or Pepsi a day. They are called Colaholics. The industry prefers to call its most prolific consumers heavy users, or the six-pack-at-a-time folks. In the 70s, Pepsi went after these heavy users with warlike dispatch. Salesmen were called shop troops. Promotions were weapons. And the most successful weapon of all was the Pepsi Challenge. As a Coca-Cola drinker, you prefer M. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And which was it you preferred? Yeah, I guess, Pepsi. Just over half the Coca-Cola drinkers tested in the Dallas-Fort Worth area prefer Pepsi. <laughs> well, I'll be there any time. Well, in the first place, Coke was terribly affronted. But I mean, how could anybody come out and say, you know, their product wasn't as good as, as somebody else's? Uh, so the first period of years was to uh, say this is impossible and to try to make f fun of it and try to disparage the uh, Pepsi challenge. First try S, sir, then L. Come a big city, don't you, boy? Yes, I do. Thought so. You got one of them skinny little big city mouths. Now, look here. Let me tell you something. You can't tell nothing from no test like this. Give me that bottle of Coke. I'll show you how we drink them down here. We don't sit around in no fancy bars taking little bitty sips and wearing skinny britches and pointy lizard shoes. You can't come down here flam flamming honest people. You got to watch what you do down here, boy. There is no question that we believe that at some point, we will be the number one soft drink company. And that's uh, what motivates everything that, that, that we do. Hi, I'm a talking Coca-Cola vending machine. You need to put in more money. God. How much does it want? Make the selection, please. Thank you for using the talking blender. You're welcome. Come again. Don't forget your change. Oh, of course. Machines such as these are the latest ingenious weapons. 
in the long war of attrition between Coca-Cola and Pepsi. You'll be pleased to know that they also speak French, Spanish and Japanese. Seriously though, folks, it says here that a can of Coca-Cola contains carbonated water, sugar, caramel colour, phosphoric acid, natural flavourings and caffeine. But what is missing here is the secret ingredient of Coca-Cola. It's called 7X and is said to be a blend of the Brazilian coca leaf and the African cola nut and other exotic things. It was this secret formula which Coke's inventor, John Pemberton, claimed could sharpen the intellect, cure hysteria, depression, and even impotence. According to the Coca-Cola company, this secret is locked away in a vault in the Trust Company Bank here in Atlanta, and only the most senior directors can look at it. And these keepers of the secret of the real thing, of course, can't fly on the same aircraft together. And of course, it's not quite as silly as it sounds. What it's all meant to say is that Coca-Cola was created perfect in a mysterious way. Then it grew up to be clean and wholesome. Forget the phosphoric acid and the sugar and the caffeine. And its guiding light has always been truth in advertising. Now, what does all that sound like? You're right, a religion. A religion complete with creation myth, a set of consecrating values and a gospel. Now think how popular God would have been if only his image people had thought of a slogan like it's the real thing. He might even have been as popular as Coca-Cola. Fish is the name. You know, I enjoy watching TV just like you do. And I know this. TV's even more fun with a bottle of Coke in hand. There's nothing like the flavor of ice-cold Coca-Cola. The real power of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola is here in Washington and in the White House itself. There have been Coca-Cola presidents and Pepsi-Cola presidents. That is to say, each company has in turn exercised often considerable influence over the president and the affairs of state. From Franklin D. Roosevelt to Harry Truman, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson and Jimmy Carter. Only Democratic presidents have been the patrons of Coca-Cola, with the notable exception of Dwight Eisenhower. President Johnson had a button on his desk which gushed Coca-Cola. Of course, the most famous Pepsi-Cola president was Richard Nixon. This is Nixon drinking Coca-Cola, a rare sight indeed. For Nixon owed much of his career to Pepsi, and Pepsi owed much to him. When as vice president he went to Moscow for a trade fair in 1959, he was taken aside by a Pepsi super salesman called Donald Kendall, who told him, my one purpose is to get a bottle of Pepsi into the hands of Khrushchev. Nixon replied, don't worry, I'll do it. And during the famous kitchen debate that followed, an extraordinary relationship was joined between Nixon and Pepsi, capitalism and communism. Although Nixon was looking here like the next president, his fortunes were to change. In 1960, he was narrowly defeated for the presidency by John Kennedy. Two years later, he suffered an ignominious defeat in the election for governor of California, and this is how he said bye-bye. Just think how much you're going to be messy. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. But Nixon was already on his way back. Pepsi made him the company's lawyer, and Nixon set out to put Pepsi firmly on the world market and himself in the White House. Nixon's big interest has always been uh, foreign policy, and I was running our international company. In fact, I tried to originally get him, instead of going to the law firm, to come in as chairman of our uh, international company because he had tremendous contacts around the world. And at that point in our, our development, we were opening markets. Uh, we were a very small international company at, uh, at that point, and we got going during that period where we were opening uh, a new plant about every 11 working days. Uh, and Nixon was very helpful in uh, opening doors, for example, in, in Taiwan. 
uh, we couldn't get in Taiwan because the local competition, they just wouldn't permit it. It had nothing to do with, you know, with our product or anything else. It just they didn't want the competition. And I had a meeting with Nixon with Chiang Kai-shek, and that solved that problem. Nixon's worldwide travels during the 60s, partly paid for by Pepsi-Cola, followed a pattern. At each stop, whether it was Beirut or Manila, he would announce to the local press that he would accept the Republican Party's nomination for president if asked to run. Invariably, he would hold talks with a national leader, and Pepsi-Cola's ambitions in that country would be associated with the ambitions of a possible future president of the United States. It wasn't long before Nixon had acquired something of the statesmanlike image he needed to get over his checkered past. Uh, how long have you been working here at the Kremlin? Like the image of Pepsi itself, he had progressed from the kitchen into the living room. In 1968, after campaigning in a Pepsi plane and drawing financial benefit from Pepsi contacts, Nixon's astonishing comeback was complete. He was president. Within a month of his inauguration, he made Donald Kendall of Pepsi head of the National Alliance of Businessmen. Throughout his career, uh, in fact, uh, he is generally known by his, uh, in, uh, for, uh, among his business colleagues as uh, uh, the man who pours it on. In 1971, Kendall went to Moscow with an American trade mission. At the Kremlin, Kendall produced a radio in the shape of a can of Pepsi and played it to Prime Minister Kosygin. Everybody laughed. Kosygin got the point, and later that evening he approached Kendall. I understand you want to trade Pepsi-Cola for vodka, he said. Yes, sir, said the Pepsi president, and they shook hands on a deal making Pepsi-Cola the first American consumer product to be made and sold in the Soviet Union. The Soviets uh, are generally concerned about the problem of alcoholism. This is what Kosygin constantly talked about. Uh, and he wanted a, a product that he thought might divert the people from consuming alcohol uh, and asked a lot of questions about PepsiCo and how far he could ship it and the shelf life and that type of thing and talked a lot about alcoholism. Matter of fact, when I, when I saw him after we opened our first plant, I told him I didn't think we were very successful because we opened the plant at Del Rosisk and we went uh, by hydrofoil down to Sochi in the Black Sea. And we arrived at the, the pier and a mayor made this big speech upon our arrival and announced with great pleasure to me that the number one drink in Sochi had become Pepsi-Cola and vodka. Kendall understood one truth, that communist countries could best serve American interests as monopoly markets rather than as adversaries. Pepsi's Russian deal was announced within two weeks of Nixon's re-election in 1972 and was perhaps the effective beginning of a pragmatic foreign policy called detente. It became the symbol of, of detente. Uh, and a lot of Soviets have, uh, have said this to me, that the only thing that they saw, the visible thing that they could, that could see, was, was Pepsi-Cola that, that started during this period of, uh, of, of detente. But while businessmen like Kendall saw detente as a means of serving American interests, Ronald Reagan saw it as an obstacle to establishing total American superiority. Let us not be satisfied with a foreign policy whose principal accomplishment seems to be our acquisition of the right to sell Pepsi-Cola in Siberia. Reagan, of course, was no chimp. He'd been selling things to the American public for a long time, such as stay press shirts, soap, the delights of smoking, and making a fast buck. But is he a Pepsi president? Or is he, like his predecessor, a Coke president? Carter, a Georgia boy, was very much a Coca-Cola president. He appointed one of Coca-Cola's lawyers to be Attorney General of the United States, and the then chairman of Coca-Cola, Paul Austin, shuttled unofficially and often secretly between the White House and President Sadat, Fidel Castro, and P. King. Carter acknowledged the political power of Coca-Cola when he said, we have our own built-in State Department at the Coca-Cola Company, they provide me ahead of time with penetrating analysis of what a country is, who its leaders are, and what its problems are. Jimmy Carter was good old 
a good old Georgia boy. Grew up, became governor of Georgia. But during the war, he was in the Navy. In the summer of 1942, he had been um, appointed by his congressman as a candidate for the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Of course, the appointment's one thing, and getting it being qualified is another. Jimmy Carter qualified in all respects except his feet. He had flat feet, at least at that time. And his mother told me, when I went on a visit down to Plains, Georgia, that, the, that he finally qualified uh, concerning the flat feet because he spent that summer before the final uh, uh, physical test rolling the soles of his feet over Coke bottles. In running for president, Jimmy Carter was Coca-Cola's man. Tony Schwartz, the advertising man who had made 300 commercials for Coke, was brought in to help sell Carter the candidate. To Schwartz, selling an image of a politician was no different from selling the image of a soft drink, as long as you kept to the rules and didn't mention what the product contained. One of Carter's first acts as president was to change the soft drink vending machines in the White House. Out went Pepsi, in went Coke. Then there was Portugal, where Coke had been banned for 60 years. Carter obliged Portugal with a $300 million loan, and Coke was into a new rich market. However, the big payoff was China, and not even Mao, who had kicked out Coke in 1949, could hold back the tide of sugar, caffeine, and Doc Pemberton secret juices, for which a billion gullets beckoned. An American medical group warned Deputy Premier Deng Xiaoping, don't do it. Few American food products are more injurious to health than Coca-Cola. For China to have Coke is irrational. But the Chinese, who alas had only happiness cola, wanted the real thing. That was 1978. The Soviet Union, China's principal foe, had just signed a friendship treaty with Vietnam. The Chinese reacted by concluding two alliances. First, with the standard bearer of American commerce, Coca-Cola, and two days later with the American government. Coke politely waited a week to announce the deal formally so as not to upstage Carter when he announced America's recognition of its once most hated enemy. The fact is that for a number of years, prior to the official recognition, uh, you know, governmental recognition between the People's Republic of China and the United States, operating under the laws of the United States, we sensed that sooner or later, I mean, the handwriting was on the wall, that the relationship between the United States and China would begin to open up. It was beginning to open up. Mm -hmm. And the company began to attend the trade fairs uh, in, uh, in China, began to uh, start some actual trade with various uh, agencies in the Chinese uh, government, began to uh, develop relationships, began to get them acquainted with our kind of system. When the Chinese government said, we would like to talk seriously about opening up a franchise, they were making judgments about their relationships with the United States. And it was logical for them to come to someone who, with whom they had established a decent relationship to be one of the first. And uh, aside from that, there was no hidden agenda and no uh, basic communication between the Coca-Cola company and the, and the U.S. government on that issue. We were abiding by the laws of the land. Coca-Cola started negotiating with the Chinese very, very early. Now, were you pre-Kissinger? We were six years ahead of the actual uh, uh, recognition where it was agreed that embassies would open up. Six years prior to that, there was contact between the Coca-Cola company and, uh, and uh, people in the Chinese government. To understand the moves and fortunes of the Coca-Cola company is to understand much about American foreign policy. Coca-Cola quietly shut down its operation in South Vietnam well before America's hurried departure in 1975. Did Coca-Cola know something 
Even Washington didn't know? The Coca-Cola company is, uh, and its product is absolutely non-political. And we do business with any country that, uh, that the U.S. government will do business with. We're a U.S.-based uh, mm. company. From a personal point of view, uh, I believe that the best way to get to know people who have a different political philosophy than you, and perhaps the best way to encourage uh, world harmony, is to establish world trade because people who are, find some way to do business with each other uh, tend to be able to iron out some of their other differences. So that uh, uh, when we do business in, in communist countries, uh, we don't sacrifice any of our principles. <laughs> There are no mean people in the world, just thirsty ones. No really bad guys, just guys who are hot and tired and bugged. Coca-Cola can take care of them. There's something good-natured about the taste of Coke, a sort of uh, get-the-chip-off-your-shoulder niceness that lets the real you shine through. In fact, you could say the special kind of goodness in Coke brings out the goodness in people. Both Coke and Pepsi are heavily invested in Latin America, and their local franchise operators, which are not subsidiaries, and therefore not directly responsible to headquarters in the United States, can virtually do what they like. The franchise operator in Guatemala in the 70s was John C. Trotter, a Texan who believed that godless communism had infiltrated everywhere, except the Coca-Cola company. Guatemala has one of the world's worst records in human rights. Death squads murder and torture with impunity, while four out of five children suffer from malnutrition. Trotter paid his Coca-Cola workers less than $2 a day, and when they began to unionize, three union officials were murdered and two union lawyers were kidnapped. Coca-Cola means crime in Guatemala, a union official told a meeting of shareholders in America. He asked the company to intervene and to stop the bloodshed, to which Coca-Cola's management replied that such an intrusion into the affairs of an independent bottler would be improper. In 1980, under worldwide pressure, Coke sacked the notorious Trotter. But of course, the company is still in Guatemala. There have been places where we've, uh, where for one reason or other, we've had to leave. But in the vast majority of the countries, the fact that we're dealing with entrepreneurs rather than governments, mm. I think is quite uh, valid, the difference. Governments change mm. at the whim of people. Businesses hire people, they pay people, they build, they stay, mm. they pay taxes, they uh, support charities, mm. they're part of the community. And, uh, you know, governments are here today and gone tomorrow. The Chilean government of Salvador Allende was here today and gone tomorrow, thanks to a CIA operation. The Pepsi-Cola bottler in Chile was Augustin Edwards, publisher of the El Mercurio newspaper, which according to a Senate report became a CIA front. When Allende was elected, Edwards flew to Washington and met Henry Kissinger and Richard Helms, director of the CIA. These were crucial meetings, according to Helms, and were arranged by Donald Kendall, president of Pepsi-Cola. What happens when um, a company like Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola is accused of meddling in the politics of a certain country? This has happened to both corporations. And you mentioned South America, Chile in particular. Uh, John, um, when you get that kind of uh, 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 publicity, and and when you get relationships that, you know, that you spoke of earlier with, in both countries with the, with the White House, you frequently get accused of having power that you really don't uh, have. Um, one of them, for example, is, the, is, is in the case of the overthrow of, uh, of Allende, uh, in which I actually ended up before the grand jury. Um, and in Argentina, I couldn't go to Argentina for a long time because they had me listed as running CIA in South America, the, 
Pepsi Cola was just a, a, a cover up. Uh, and actually, our bottler, uh, Pepsi Cola bottler uh, in Chile, happens to own the El Mercurio uh, newspaper. And uh, when he came up here, Nixon wanted to the same and I and he'd met him previously with me and uh, I took him down for the meeting uh, which started the campaign uh, but I really had nothing to do except the introduction but uh, I got blamed as though I was uh, running the, the whole show. The overthrow of Chile's last democratically elected government had begun. Three years later Allende was shot and Chile sank into military repression from which it has yet to recover. Of course Pepsi Cola is still in Chile. It's no paradox that as American foreign policy was trying to overthrow Allende in Chile at this time, uh, that there were, at the same time, American foreign policy was trying to establish detente with the Soviet Union. Um, on one hand, you have, you have Allende, who in the eyes of Augustin Edwards, the Pepsi botherer, and many others, was threatening to close off the marketplace from American interests. And on the other hand, with detente, you had the Soviet Union, who very, very cautiously, very gradually, was opening up the marketplace for American interests. And this is the essence, as we see it, of, of American foreign policy. The real essence, when you distill everything away, is you have is access to the marketplace. If you give us access to the marketplace, we'll do business with you, regardless if you are you're fascist or if you're communist or if you're anything in between. Just like if you deny us that access, then there are going to be problems. But the problems are not just political. In a survey of malnutrition in developing countries where Coke and Pepsi dominate, a priest wrote from his remote region, the great majority of people here are convinced that soft drinks must be consumed every day. This is mainly due to extensive advertising. In the meantime, in these same villages, natural products such as fruit are consumed less. In some families, just once a week. Other families even sell their own natural products in order to buy soft drinks. I think that uh, you have to look at it in the context of what people do in their lifestyles uh, in, in the emerging countries. Many people have tried to sell strictly nutritional products. Mm. The, the fact of the matter is the people won't drink it. Mm. Yeah. The people won't eat it. Uh, they are ingrained in terms of what their, their local uh, you know, diets and lifestyles happen to be. A Pepsi-Cola is never sold as a food product. Uh, it's sold as a, a, a part of, of leisure, part of enjoyment. And for many people, having a, a, a Pepsi-Cola uh, is you know, equivalent to us going to the uh, theater or, or doing something over here, that's, that's, that's a lot greater luxury. Um, so I, I don't think that the nutritional argument is, is one that, 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 that we would ever make with Pepsi-Cola. We're not trying to sell it as something nu nutritional. We're trying to say, you know, it's, it's a part of, of, of having fun, it's a part of enjoyment, uh, and it's a, a very high quality product. But it's not a nutritional product, never sold that way. We make no health claim for no. Coca-Cola because uh, while Coca-Cola can provide energy, it mm. certainly fills a need of providing refreshing liquid. Mm. But you see, it also provides purity. And in a great many countries around the world, uh, you don't have the luxury even of going to a tap and getting a decent potable glass of pure water. Mm. Uh, Coca-Cola provides uh, absolute purity to people and they can take a drink of this beverage, get the refreshment, get energy, and in some countries, that's an issue. But more importantly, uh, know that the, what they're drinking is not going to harm them. But we make no health claim for the product. We know that there is a place in society, in every society, even the most primitive society, for a, a moment of refreshment. They're going to find it, and when they find it in Coke, they get one that's pure and clear and tasty and very inexpensive. In 1968, a Senate Select Committee was set up in the United States to look into hunger and the relationship of diet to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and other ailments. In 1973, the chairman, Senator George McGovern, put the following question to Dr. G.D. Campbell, an authority on diabetes. In terms of sugar intake, where do you put the kind of soft drinks that we consume in this country on the scale of offenders? Dr. Campbell replied, I must declare an interest here because I'm actually in the employ of Coca-Cola, but I think that soft drinks are the biggest villains of all. 
because they are the thing that starts the children off. The time to start nutrition education is the time when too many children are drinking a litre of sugar-sweetened Coca-Cola every day. Although other expert witnesses defended a moderate intake of sugar, the committee's findings singled out soft drinks for the harm they did and recommended a drastic reduction in their manufacture. This, of course, did not happen. And since then, soft drink consumption in America, of which Coke and Pepsi are the undisputed leaders, could soon exceed that of water. Do you ever reflect that so much power and influence and energy and money is focused on something that is only a soft drink? Isn't that wonderful? I think it's fantastic, um, John, that you can, you can build up a company and create an image with a product that's just a soft drink, that you that pleasant experience. That, you can make that occur all around the world. I uh, go to bed every night uh, thinking that we add a lot of brightness to life. A little, a little child down in Columbia, a young wife, 19 years old, who really doesn't have a lot of hope about what they're going to do with life. When they go down to that little bodego and they put a few pennies down on the table, Nothing, it's not money that's going to change their lifestyle by spending it on a Coke. But for a moment, she's got her hand around the same thing that the president of that country is drinking. Or that uh, people of every walk of life drink. And uh, I think that's terribly violent. Out on Remsen Mellow Beach, G.I. Romance with Native Peach. All night long, make tropic love the next day, sitting hot sun and cool off, drinking rum and coke.